Pardon. Wow, I have actually missed a lot. Okay, so um, so suppose you want to read your your data, you know. Um, so call PD dot press tab. If you press tab, like I told you, do not memorize function because there are so many. So press tab. If I press R, so because I'm not sure. So you see, we have. I can use read underscore CSV to read CSV file, read Excel to read Excel file, even HDF, HTML, JSON file. So different files that you can read using pandas. So, but because this is an Excel file, I will use read Excel and put that. So I can pass in my file name, but it's going to tell me error and I will show you why it's going to tell me error. So, because if you're using Mac, this will not show error. But because if you're using Windows, uh, it doesn't, this, um, I think we call this back, is it backslash? Yeah, this backslash. It doesn't actually recognize that. So, to avoid that error, just put R before the uh, quotation mark and then rerun that. It's not going to give you error anymore. Okay, so that's how to read um, your Excel file. Similarly, what I just showed you, you can do that for CSV. The same thing is going to give me error. Just put your R there. So remember for CSV, you read CSV. Okay, not read Excel because this is a CSV file. See dot CSV. So, um, and that is going to give me uh, reading my data. So you can try that. Now, suppose you do not have your data, you have to, you want to create your own uh, data frame in uh, using pandas. You can use the dictionary that we've uh, we talked about. Suppose your data is in a dictionary format where the key is the ID. Your key, which is the ID, will become the column name or the variable or the feature. Now the values is just this set. Uh, we thought it's just this list, list of variable. We talked about list last class too. So you have list, ball, pencil, pen, and so on. You have another key called price, and the value is stored in a list. So to create a data frame out of it, you use PD dot data frame. PD dot data frame. Remember the capital letter. I mean, you don't need to memorize it, like I said. So if you remove that dot press tab. So if you scroll down, you see data frame here. You can click that. I mean, as you work with it over and over, you just automatically know it. But at the beginning, you don't need to memorize that. So you, you can then you can run. Remember to see your data frame, call back the variable again, and run that. You have your data frame. So next thing is, when you have your data, what are the first things you need to quickly do? You need to quickly check something, like explore the data. At least you should be able to quickly explore the data, like check how many rows, how many columns, how many variables you have there. At least visualize that. So what? So uh, uh, um, uh, one way to do that, at least check the first five columns. So do that. I've stored my data in DF. Okay. So call the DF. Put your dot and check add. Add them means mean give me the first five rows. So if you run that. It's going to give me the first five rows, starting from index zero to four, meaning five. If I want more than five, I could put 10 inside that head. It's going to give me the first 10. Okay, but if you, by default, it gives you just the first five rows. Okay, so here you can see your data, you can see the variables you have, and each of them like that. You can also select the last five rows using tail, your data frame dot tail. And it gives you the last um, five rows of your data. Okay, so that's how, so when you have your data, quickly check, just quickly explore it. Check the first five rows or the last five rows. You can also check the columns. Suppose that you have many, very, many columns, because in the real world, uh, you're going to be working with so many variables, like even more than 100, 1,000 of them sometimes. So suppose I just want to check it. Maybe there are not that many. I want to check that. Put dot and press tab. You see columns there under this. See columns. If you do that, 
it's going to give you the columns of your data, like all these variables, all these features you have in your data, the month, the starting balance, repayment, interest rate, and so on. So that's how to quickly do that. Suppose you do not know the data types of, you don't know the data types of your data. Like when I mean data types, are they, are the features integers? Are they object? Object means they are categorical data. Are they float, things like that. So you can use that using the D types. But like I said, you don't need to memorize that. Just press start. It lists you, it lists that out. See, if, if I press D, it gives me the D types here. Just take it there, run that, and you have, so it gives you the columns, the features, the variable names, and the individual data types you have there. Like the month is an integer, starting balance, you have float, float, float 64 is just a way of storing your data. You see float, meaning it has decimal points. And then object that means, it's not an integer, it's not a flow, meaning it's a categorical data. We are going to play with that, with that car type to see what it is. So that's how to quickly check the data types in your data frame. So how do you know? Suppose you want to check how many rows and columns you have in your data. Press your data frame. Like I said, boot dot and put tab. If you don't know that, it's, good, it's, from, it's in the shape attribute here, this shape. If you, if you run that, it gives you the number of rows, meaning you have four and eight rows or four and eight observations or four and eight samples. The second value is the number of variables or features that you have, meaning we have nine features. We have nine variables in the data, and these are these uh, features. So you can check that. Quickly check how many rows, how many columns. So here we have talked about how to check the first five rows using add, the last five rows using dot tail, to check the features or the columns. We have, we have used dot columns. We have checked the data type using D types. Remember, don't memorize it. Just put dot in front of the data frame and press tab. To check the number of rows and columns, just dot shape, meaning or size, to check the size of your data. And we can also use the info method. Um, the info method to check, to give you, you know, both the columns, the data type, and non null here is telling you that it's not missing. Like four and eight values are not missing. So looking at this now, it looks as if we don't have any missing data in this because if you look at the top here, you have four and eight entries. And for each of these data, each of these features, it looks like they all have four and eight non null. Non null means non missing. So, I mean, but you can explicitly check your missing uh, values. But this is also one way to quickly know whether you have missing values or not. You will see as we go on. But if you want to explicitly check whether the variables that have missing values or they don't have, all you need to do call your data frame, use is null. And then if I, if I just put is null, it's going to give me booleans. This doesn't really make sense. So to check, so just put dot sum, meaning sum all of these values together. So, and this gives me the number of missing values I have. So here I, only, I have zero, zero, zero missing value, meaning there are no missing values, just like I confirmed with you using the info method. Okay, you can also use is na instead of is null. Is na is the same thing. They are both going to give you the same, you know, result. Both the is na and the is null. They are both going to give you the same result. Okay, so that's how to check missing values explicitly in your data. So how can you quickly perform some descriptive statistics? Like you want to check the mean, the count, the maximum number the minimum number and so on in your data. So take your data frame, dot, press tab. You will see if a method called describe. This describe is just going to describe your data, meaning descriptive statistics. See, it's gonna give you, for each variable, it's giving you the count, the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum, the 25%, meaning the lower quartile, the median, 50% of your data, 75%, the upper quarter, 
and the maximum value in each variable in your data frame. But the, the funniest thing about this describes that the default method is only going to give you the discrete attributes for only the numeric data. You can see car type is not there. See, there is no car type there. But there is a way we can do that. Uh, let me quickly say this. If you want to know more about the function or the method you have applied, put your cursor inside the bracket in that function and press Shift Tab. Shift Tab. Put your cursor there and press Shift Tab. You can see it pops up something. Click on this plus and read more about that function. You see, descriptive statistics include those that summarize the central tendency, blah, 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 and all, and all of that. So is if I put this variable include all, it's going to include the categorical variable too. Let's do that. Include um, all and run that. You see, it includes car type, but now it's giving me non uh, NA meaning uh, not a number. Uh, for some reason, and I will take question when we're about to go to the breakout session. So just put your question in the chat box and someone will answer you. But by the time we get to the breakout rooms, you are free. I mean, we we'll explore every other question. Okay. So you can see it has any hand, not a number. That's because it's a categorical variable. It only gives you the counts, the unique variables there, the top very the top uh category in that car type, the frequency, meaning the number of times the number of occurrence of the, the uh, categories there. Every other thing, you can't calculate mean on a categorical variable. So that's why it's giving you any end for all of that. Okay, the same thing happens to all of them. So, but if you do not, if you remove the include all, it's just going to give you the descriptive statistics for the numeric variable, the continuous variable in your data. Okay, so, Panda series. What is Panda series? Now, this is your data frame. Okay, this is your data frame. A single column, a single variable in your data frame is what we call Panda series. Just one variable. See, if I select just the principal page here, that's Panda series. That's just one single variable. So one single variable, a single column in your data frame is what we call series. So if I want to make it a data frame, then I will use a uh, double square bracket around it. And then it's going to be a data frame. How do you do that? Let's confirm by choosing the type method to check the type of that. If you want to verify what I'm saying, see, it tells you that is a data frame. But let me remove the one square bracket from it and run the type again on it. It tells you it's Panda series. So when you select just one variable, it is Panda series. Now you will say that, but you still, use, you still selected one variable even though you are using square bra a double square bracket. That's because I'm telling you that you should, when you use double square bracket, it means that you are as well free to select more than one variable. Like select another variable, um, let's say month, you know? That means you are saying you should select, you can select more than that. But with a single square bracket, you cannot select more than one variable. Yeah, if you do that, I mean, let's try that now. Let me remove the type. You, if you do that, it's gonna give you error. One way to get your, to understand this more is try them out. Just try them out. Yeah, see, it gives me error. Because I am using, I'm selecting more than one variable, more one features using one square bracket. Let me put double and you will see that it's not going to give me error. See, so that is it. So meaning for Panda series, you are only selecting a single variable. If you want a data frame, you want to select uh, a data frame, you have to use double square bracket and then you can pass in a list of the variables you want to select, okay? Uh, I mean, I've, this selecting multiple features, I've already talked about that here. Use more than, use double square bracket and then you can pass in a list of the features. That's what I just did here, okay? 
So let's let's start exploring the data more and look at let's look at the car type, which is the car type variable. This 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 feature. Let's look at it and explore it more. Let's see how many categories we have there and the number of unique categories there. So take your data frame, select the variable car type. Okay. So suppose I want to count the unique variables there because it's a Panda series. Remember, Panda series you only select one single variable. Use the value counts. I don't want to memorize. I'm pressing tab. Let's see. So you see, I press tab and I put V. It gives me what I can apply the value counts. So do that is a method and then run it. So it, it tells me the, the categories I have in car type and how many of each of them. Meaning I have VW, Gov, R, 144 times. Now look at the person that entered this data. See the terrible mistakes. The person wanted to write Toyota Corolla, and, but the person put two categories there. Toyota Corolla and Toyota Carola. I mean, maybe I'm not current. I don't think there's anything called Toyota Carola. I may be wrong. But so in case someone made a mistake of data entry, which might be difficult for you to use Excel to detect, this is why programming language is interesting. You can detect that now. I see, oh, this, there is a mistake here. Maybe if this name is not Jenny, oh, Toyota Carola, maybe the person make a mistake. But see, if, if it was a mistake, the person did this 111 times. So that's how to count that using value underscore counts. Okay? So um, I'm just trying to rush through this so that uh, we can use the breakout session and learn more on this, okay? Um, how do you select your column names? Two ways. One way I've already did that up here. Call your data frame and then put a square bracket. Put your column name in, the bra in, in that square bracket like card type. That's one way to select. If you do that and run that, it's going to give you. So suppose, what other way? I can, another way to select it is just to put dot, put the car type there, and it's still gonna give me the same thing. However, the only time you can use this second approach is if the data frame, the variables in, the variable you want to select does not have space between them. Let's try with a variable that has space between them, like this um, interest page and use this second method, this second approach, and select interest speed. It's going to give me error. You can see it's pointing to the second variable because there are spaces. So you cannot use this second approach of using just dot if you have spaces between your, uh, between your variable. So you, but you can use this, other, this first method. You can use that. If, even if you have space in between there, your variable. So let me comment out this one and rerun that. See, it works. So I'm just showing you so that you know whichever method you want to use. But if you're using this second approach, make sure your variable name does not have a space between them. If it does, then you use their first approach. Now, suppose most actually is not advisable for your data, for your variable to have space between them. You can use, you know, uh, just separate them maybe with underscore. So how do you do that? You can rename the data frame using the rename method. Now, uh, you don't need to memorize it like I said. Press come there, press shift tab to see what and what you need to be there. DF dot rename. What and what do you need to have? Say columns. So these columns are is actually if one of the attributes in that method. Columns by default is none. And I also talk about, about this in place. So if you want to do that, just pass in your columns. The reason we're using dictionary is because you can rename more than one variable at a time. So just pass in your columns, open, this, even if you don't know how to do that, see if you scroll down this, it gives you examples. Examples that you can go through and see how they did it and do it yourself. So don't memorize it. Just put a cursor, the pressure tab, 
read through it, see the examples there, then you will be able to try it out yourself. Okay? So that's why we're using Jupyter Notebook because it makes it, you know, easier for you to learn even on your own. Okay? Um, so that's why we're using these columns, blah, 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 equals to this. So I can rename that. But even if I do run this cell like that, it's not going to, the changes will not be reflected. Let me, let me confirm that by putting dot columns here to, so that you see. See, we've, we've changed pre, uh, principal pay to principal pay, principal that's called pay, but it's not reflecting. That is what that in place that I told you is doing. This in place, see, by default, it's using in place, in place equals to false. In place means let the changes you have made be effective. So if you set it to true, it's going to uh, actually be reflected. So in place equals to true. And then let's rerun it. You see, seeing the principal paid now is now you know, reflected there. So anytime you want to do that, you want the changes to be reflected and you don't want to set it to a new variable, just set your in place to be true. If you're not sure, press shift tab like I told you and see if it has the argument in place. If it does, set it to be true except you do not want the changes to be reflected. So you can also rename more than one uh, features, at it, more than one feature, just your key. Let's say the key, let's, uh, let's say is new balance I want to uh, do, new balance, that's the original name, that's what goes to the key. The value is the new one you want to do. Let's say I want to do new bar and run it. You can see it's, it's now effective. So that's how to rename the variables or the columns in your data frame. You have a lot to cover today, so I really need you to follow along before you we break out into sections. Okay, so um, let me quickly do a, a short recap of what we've done. We've looked at how to describe your data, how to explicitly check for missing values using is null or is na dot sum. Sum means sum all the missing value for each variable. We've looked at how to quickly do a descriptive statistics by using the describe method on your data frame. But remember, describe will only give you four by default for the continuous variables. But you can as well use include the cost on all inside it to give you for all others. But I don't think that will look nice. Okay? I, then I talked about Panda series to be a single variable in your data frame. Uh, but uh, if you want to select multiple columns, multiple variables, you wrap it in a uh, double square bracket, and then you can pass in the list of the va uh, variables or features you want to select. Okay, I talked about counting the categorical variables. Select the variable and use value underscore counts. And then if you, but this only works on categorical variable, not on numeric variable, because it has, numeric variable does not have categories. So it, this will not work, okay? Then slicing, which is, slicing means you want to index it, like we selected just the interest paid. I showed you two methods. I showed you this other one using dots, but I said this other one will only work if there is no space between your variable name. Then we also looked at how to rename using a rename method, you know? So uh, let me quickly talk about subsetting or indexing your data using what we call the lock method or the I lock method. So, um, so this, when you use the lock method, you, in front of the law, you must always pass in a square bracket. Now, the first argument in that lock represent your rows. The second represent your columns. Putting column here means I want all the rows. And then I want, I want all the rows for only car type. I want all the rows for only car type. And then add here means just show me the first five. Just show me the first five. So if you run that, it just shows me the first five for only the car type. If you, if you remove add, it's gonna show you everything. Okay, now. You can also select more than one uh, variable name, more than one features. And that's why you pass in, I include a square bracket there, meaning I can select more than that. 
Yeah, uh, suppose I want to do the interest paid. Um, do I, I don't know, let me confirm the, okay, interest, pay, interest rates. Okay, um, look at that. So I can select these two variables because normally when you have a large data frame, it's good to subset your data. I can subset it and save it as a new variable name. Maybe I want to quickly visualize the cut up and the interest rate. I can subset that using lock and save it as a new variable name and then visualize it. When you have large data uh, frame, you, this subsetting of your data is a good skill to know how to do that, okay? So how to, uh, is a good skill to have. So suppose I just want to select just the card type and the interest paid for only two rows, the row 10 and row 15. I have to specify those two rows here. I can use look, this dot look. See, it gives me the card type and the interest rate for row 10 and for row 15. So you can do that. But if you want to select all the rows, remember putting your column there instead of this 10 and 15. Okay. I'm sorry if you if I'm moving fast. Uh, yeah, but it's just that we have a lot to cover. Okay. Filter out the data for where the to for the total CNR column. So to do that, your data frame, pass in your, let's, let's save it as a new variable. Let's call it car CNR, okay? This is your data frame. This is your, uh, pass in your variable, which is the car type. And say, the, I want it where the car type is equals to Toyota Sienna. Okay, but if I do this, let, let me show you what the output is going to be. It's going to give me Boolean. But if I want the data frame itself, wrap everything in the data frame again. Wrap everything, meaning subset the data frame by that and then rerun that. So it gives me the data frame only for where the car type is Sienna. So that's how, so you can, these are tools you can do when you have large data frame and you want to quickly explore the data and visualize some variables. So here now this, all the data frame here only contains where the car type is Toyota Sienna. Okay, so you can do that. And that's why I put here that you can check the head, blah, blah, and so on. Okay, so, um, all these are doing the same thing. I've done what I, what I did here, I've done it here. So this is, this is for Toyota car, uh, Corolla, do the same thing. Specify where the, the car type is equal to Toyota Corolla. If you do not wrap everything back in the data frame, it's only going to give you the Boolean, whether it's false or true. And then if you want to see the data frame itself, wrap it back in the data frame. Wrap this, what you subset, what you selected, in with the data frame, and then it gives you um, Toyota Corolla is not defined because I didn't I didn't put in a column in quotes. Sorry. Mm, let me see. Do I get the name very well? Um, See, so it's capital letter Toyota Corolla. Yep, this should work. That's because I didn't run that cell before running this. So what is the issue? So that's it. You can always have error is 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 okay. Um, Toyota Corolla. Get your data frame. Wrap it back. Normally, I won't, I won't do this. That's okay. Maybe I didn't use dot lock. Normally, I, will, I, I love doing the one I showed you. Just wrap it around it. Okay. Um, so, but still, it should work. Because if I wrap it around here, 
should work. So I don't know why it should work. So I don't know why it's not working here. I don't know, I don't know why it's not working there. So but not now to waste the time, that's just what I did here. Wrap everything back in your data frame and visualize it, and that will give you where the data is Toyota Corolla. And I know I'm missing something there. So, but it's, it's okay to have error because you are never going to be uh, write code and it will always run all the time, no. But the process of you checking the error and spending time on that is what makes you know it the more. Okay, so um, so I guess this shouldn't work. So since that didn't work, yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why he's not accepting this matter. I don't know. But but instead of using look, it's the same another way just to do what I've done here. Okay, so I don't want to spend more time on that because of where we are going. So using look and I look, there's another one called the I look, that's the integer location, integer low. Meaning this means they select all the rows for only column that have index position of two and five in your data frame. If we go to our data frame, this is zero, one, two, that's repayment, three, four, five, that's new balance. So if I run that, this should work. So it gives me the repayment and new balance. However, I don't, I don't encourage this idea because if you have large uh, data frame where you have many columns, you will always not know where, what the index position of those stuff. So if you are, but another way to do that is to use log instead of integer log. But if you're using log, you have to specify those variable names, those column names. You have to specify them instead of using their index position. That's just the difference between the log and the I log. I log, you specify the index position. Log, you specify the column names. It's still gonna give us, it's gonna give me an error because I've already replaced, I've changed this uh, new bar to this. Yeah, so these are now, this, these are, you can see you have the same thing, you have the same uh, result, but remember integer log, you have to specify the index position, but for log, you have to specify the variable names. So how do we do uh, some calculations? Like find the number of each car in the car type variable. I think I've done this by using the value counts up there. So um, find the number of each car in the car type. So select your, your car type and then count it by using the value counts. Remember, you don't have to memorize that. Just press, put that and press that. So this gives me the number of each of the car in this car type variable. So suppose I want to calculate the interest, total interest paid for each car. So I need to first group my data based on the car type and then uh, bring out the interest and calculate the sum. So this is my data. I use the group by method, group by. I want to group by the car type because I want to calculate the interest paid for each type of car. Group by the car type and then select your, the interest that I want to do the calculation on, interest paid. Let me see the variable name itself. I think it's, I'm not sure if interest paid. And then sum, since I need the total. So this gives me the total interest for each car, for Toyota Carola, Toyota Corolla, Toyota Sienna, and that type. So what I did is first group my data by the car type bring out the interest paid column that I want to cal do calculation on, and then sum in, sum everything, give me the total. Suppose I need the average, I can use mean. It's gonna give me the mean, the average of uh, average interest paid for each car. I can also do for median. 
but you can't do for mode. It doesn't have mode uh, method. So you can do that depending on what the, the question. You can also select group by more than one column. Suppose we want to find the average interest uh, rate, average interest paid in each month for each car type. All I need to do is to group by, um, group by these two, um, group by the month and the car type. Okay, if I group by that, since I still want to calculate the interest paid, select this interest paid and then find the average, which is the mean. And it's going to give me for month one, the car type, these are the car types, see the average, month two, this dot 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 means the data continues like that. So we're just going to give you, you know, the one, so that your window uh, screen will not be populated with data. So you can group by multiple columns. So yeah, I'm going to take some questions just on five minutes <laughs> because I know I've, I've done a lot here before continuing, okay? So I want us to be mature about that. If someone is asking questions, please do not interrupt the person so that we don't have noise uh, here. So you can see how where the car type is Sienna and interest is, let's say I want where the interest is 0 0.072. This interest is actually in the data frame. If it's not there, it's not gonna give you. So I, what I did was to first select where interest is equals to 0 0.0702. And I save that as a new variable called in filter. I also select where the car type is Toyota Sienna and save that in a new variable. Then I use the look to subset both of them, car Sienna and integer filter. I put column here means give me this for all columns in my data. I can visualize that. I mean, I can check the result of that by calling the variable again. And this gives me where the interest is 0 0.0702 and the car type is equal to Sienna, a Toyota Sienna. So before I move to, you can see why I normally use Edge so that it doesn't just fill uh, the, 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 wind, the screen. So before I move to only missing data, I'm just going to, in five minutes, take a few questions. So if you have questions, please let's be mature about this so as not to make it noisy. So if you have questions on some of what I've taught, let's see how we can quickly do that in five minutes. So you can unmute and ask. Hello, um, thank you, sir. I've watched with the in interest how you explain good explanation. My question is, you've been using the poly bracket and the round brackets and the um, other uh, square bracket interchangeably. There's no particular order. Is that the way we can use it? That's a good question. So, um, I mean, that's fantastic. Now you use, you use, um, I, I love that. I mean, <laughs> so um, let me comment this out. There are what we call attributes. There are, what we, there are some what we call method for attribute. You see, when I put shape, I didn't put bracket. That's attribute. So if I just run this, it gives me that. That means shape is an attribute. It's not a method. A method. Another name for method is function. So, but attribute like D type shape, you won't have square. If I put a round bracket there, it's going to give me error. Meaning top object is not callable because it's not a method. But where you see me using um, a square bracket, uh, using um, round bracket, that means that function is a method like this value counts. Value count is a method used on Panda series. For, for instance, I cannot use count method, just count, because this is a Panda series. But if I select multiple columns, multiple columns, I can use count because that would be, remember, multiple column means that is a data frame. Um, let's put one more variable called new bar. If I do this, it should work. 
Uh, let's see, where is the mistake? What did he say? He said, data frame of the has no attribute count. You see? Wow, I was even wrong. So that's it. It will tell you. So it tells you what you can use there. Let me see if I use value count. Value count. But it will not work on that. But I know value count will work if it's a series. So meaning any, any function that I put, um, that I put this, this uh, square uh, round bracket in front is a method, is a method. So if it is an attribute, it will not have round bracket. So if it, has, if it is a method, you have to put a round bracket there. Now the square bracket is anytime I said that last class, anytime you want to index, whether a list or a data frame or um, yeah, or an dictionary, you have to use square bracket. That's how to index, to subset your data to index. That's when you use square bracket. Okay, so that's just the difference between them. Any other question? This will be the last one I will take before going on to handling missing data. Any other question from anybody? Okay, so I will go on now. In, the, in, 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 in the reality, your data will never come clean. That's the truth. So one of the skills that we look out for in a data analyst or a data scientist is your ability to undo missing data. But however, in the community of data scientists, handling missing data is, or is, a conf is actually a conflict uh, discussion because there is no one single method, no one approach to undo missing data. In fact, many papers, research papers has been published on handling missing data. Now, me, because I have a statistics background, I have issue, I have, I mean, <laughs> we are picky about missing data because this is where understanding your data comes in. This is where working with a domain expert comes in. Because when you want to feel that, because sometimes you need to completely remove the variable with that missing data. Maybe the variable does not add so much information to your data, or it has um, uh, maybe few missing values, or many missing values, sometimes you remove it. Sometimes you just need it to fill in the missing values. But how can you fill in a missing value when you don't understand anything about the variables? So this is where understanding your data comes in. So sometimes you can fill it with zero, sometimes you can fill it with this main media, but you need to understand that data. You, that's, you need to work with a domain expert, at least, so let's say you are, work, you, you are in a manufacturing industry as a data scientist, and the, where, the, where you are building, you, you, and your goal is to build a predictive model to determine the lifetime, the life expectancy or life cycle of a particular product. You need to work with a quality assurance uh, expert or engineers there to tell you some of, you know, based on their experience working with that, they can give you an information so that when you have the data, you know whether to remove the variable if it's not, whether the variable is actually needed in the first place. So this is why in, the, in, the, in reality in the industry, as a data scientist or data analyst, you do not work alone. You don't. You are working with engineers, you are working with quality assurance people, you are working with different uh, people you know, in that organization. So there must be that collaboration. Okay, so, but suppose, let's, so everything we are working on is suppose we have an understanding of the data, we understand it. I, I think I've, so this is a new data, which um, you need to, I think it's part of the data I gave you. I use, just put your directory there and let me run that. So this is my data. I want to re rename this first variable name or named. So remember, I use the rename method. So I pass in my columns, I've explained this before. I have to write it exactly how it is in the data or named this column space zero, that's what I saw there. I want to change it with, replace it with car features. I put in place equals to true because I want the chain to be reflected. Then I can check it again and see. 
you can see I now have car features. In place equals to true is going to the effect is going to take place. So I've I've done all of this. Check out the information in the data I've shown you using dot info, missing values. I mean, let me just do that to retrieve that cars to check the missing value. So is NA or is null, and then put sum. You know, and it tells us the missing values you have. Car features obviously doesn't have any missing value. Now look at every other one. We have so many missing values here. MPG, cylinder, display, they all have that. So that's why I'm using suppose here, suppose. Because I am suppose we are, we are assuming you understand the data. So suppose you want to feed the NAs for multiple features. So how do you do that? Suppose you want to fill uh, um, just the data frame, like you want to fill, you can fill the whole features at once, <laughs> but that's, that's a terrible idea because all the features, we never have the same, you know, uh, uh, they, they, they mean different things. So filling everything at one, let's say with zero, doesn't make sense, except you understand the data. But so sometimes you can fill the NAs one by one. So suppose I just want to fill the NAs for, let's say this MPG variable with its mean. MPG has six missing values. Suppose I want to fill that with its mean. What I did there was to first calculate the mean. Cast, that's my data frame. See, uh, MPG means the variable there and apply the mean on it. So this gives me the average. If you, if you check that, see, that's the average MPG there. So suppose I now want to use that to fill the missing values. I'll select the variable name, apply fill any. If you don't understand, like you, all this, you don't need to memorize the argument that goes there. Remember, put your cursor there and press shift tab. It tells you what and what you need to fill in. Put plus, see, I need to fill in the value of what the space for this argument value. I need to put that there. So that's why I put value equals to the average I calculated here. In place, if you do not, is by default is false. If you do not set it to true, the change will not be reflected. So that's all I just did. So do not memorize this thing, please. Just put your course out there and press shift start. Okay, so if I do that, and I want to check it again to see uh, whether the effect has taken place. I want to check the missing values again. See, MPG now has zero missing values. That's it. So suppose you want to feed the NAs of displacement variable with zero. How do you do that? So the same way, CAS, select the, MP, the displacement variable, and then use the fill NA. And then I can put zero or I can put value equals to zero. And then we can check it again if you want to just see uh, what you have done, whether the effect is actually uh, reflected. You see, displacement now, oh, I didn't set in place equals to true. You see, in place equals to true. So around that, you see, displacement has zero missing values. So that's it, that's how to do that. But you can, this place, I'm trying to fill, suppose I understand by my understanding of the data that I need to fill the J uh, missing values in J by its median. What I did there was to first select J, calculate the median, save it in a variable called J median. And I ran this to give me the median is 3.5. Then I just select the variable, fill the N where the value is, J median and in place true to make it re, uh, reflected. So you can check, you can check uh, your data. Maybe I realize that the all the NAs are actually towards the tail, the tail end of the data. That's why I'm running tail on my data to see. So if you check J now, J doesn't. Uh, I didn't run this. That's why. So let's let's rerun that. See, J doesn't have any missing data again. It has now filled it with its median. So you can see 3.5, 3.5, 3.5. So that's where the missing values occur before it has fixed that with miss the, uh, all the other stuff. But you can actually fill uh, NA like for multiple, like you can fill everything at once. Suppose I want to do that for, uh, 
which other ones still have. We have feed for J, we have feed MPG. So suppose I want to do that for this. Um, let, let me even rerun the data frame to make it fresh. Okay, so suppose I want to, I want to fill the NA, like two of them at a time. Like I want to fill for both MPG, MPG and cylinder at once. Suppose I want to fill the MPG with zero. I want to fill the displacement with its mean. All you need to do is cast. So you don't need to select the column now. Select your just the data frame, fill NA, put your column. You don't need to memorize that, press Shift tab. If you scroll down, you will see an example of that in this documentation using um, value, see, I can use dictionary. You can even copy it, copy and paste it there. So first let's calculate the values first. Let's, let's paste it there, values. But in this case, I only need my MPG. Just change it. MPG, I want to fill it with zero. Displacement, I want to fill that with is mean. So I need to select the displacement variable and then calculate the mean. Okay, I don't need the other ones, so I can remove that. Okay, then what I do I need to do here? Remember, we are using the value. Just put value variable and set it to these values that you just calculated up there. And let's check what we have done. Is now some. See, uh, that's because I'm forgetting to put in place equals to true. Oh. Okay, you see now, MPG and displacement, zero, zero, like no missing values again. So you can do that in a single step, okay? So that is that about that. Before we move to NumPy, I'm going to rush through all of this because we are running ahead of time, like we're running out of time. So you can also like, create your own data frame, like using pandas or data frame, using, you know, let's say these are your data frame. I can load it you know, like that, like, I think I already talked about using pandas or data frame. You can examine your data like that, you know, to see what and what is in that A0, 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 you also, like I told you, don't need to memorize that you, if you put dot and press tab, you have that. So concat method, you can concat this data frame together. However, this will only make sense. It only be useful if they all have the same variable names. In this case, it will work well because they all have A, B, C, D as their variable names. Also in your own project, I think they both have variable names. So you can use the concat method. Just use that and verify the verify that you see you all have the data together but look at it look at the index zero one two three zero one two three zero one two three how can we amend that press go to that and press shift tab to see why you have that what can you do see this ignore index ignore index by default is set to false we can set it to true if we set it to true See, zero, one, two, three, up to, so now we have removed the index. So that is how to, you know, uh, combine two data frame and re uh, ignore the index so that you have the data, you know, together. I'm not gonna go into details of everything because of the time, but that is how to match that. And that's what you need for your project. If you want to get to understand it more, play around it, and you are free to come to like on Thursday, during the um, uh, question and answer. I'm not gonna teach any new material, but if you ask, if you want to know more about it, I can share more details about that. So even the combining data, I put it there that read more on pd.match, you know, to, on how to match the data set on common keys. So I'm just quickly going to move to NumPy, spend like five minutes on it and visualize, our, uh, and do Matplotlib to visualize our data. Then we can break out into sessions 
Okay, so NumPy is used to work with an array. What is an array? An array is a data structure that contains a group of elements. Okay, so um, um, so you import it like we did for pandas, import NumPy as np. Now this line is, now this is a list. So change it to a NumPy array, call this alias np.array. This will convert this list to a NumPy array. The same thing for the second one, I have two here. If you're running, you have them. You can add, you can do addition on your arrays. You can do division. You can do multiplication. You know, you're going to multiply them element wise, element by element. You can also index it. Remember, when you want to index, you use square bracket. Putting zero there means I want the first element there. You know, if if you if you if you put um, like I say the first five, you're going to give it the first five. Use colon, meaning the first five. You can also find the mean. Colon the numpy, np dot mean, and then pass in your array there. It's going to give you the mean. The same thing you can do that for the median, np dot median, um, and then pass in your array. Oh, sorry, I. Um, so then it gives you the median. So like that, you can, you know, uh, call on, like if you need random numbers, it is in the random package in NumPy. That's why I'm using np.random. The rand here means give me the random numbers with two rows, three columns. But the random numbers are always between zero and one. So this two and three means two rows, three columns. If I just want, Three, just three random numbers. It's going to give me that. So, but putting putting one and three, it means one call. Putting two and three, meaning two rows, three columns. This rand is different from rand n. What's the difference? The values rand n we give is from a standard normal distribution. What is a standard normal distribution? Is a distribution with mean of zero and variance of one, or standard deviation of one. So these values have the mean of zero and standard deviation of one. So that's when you use RAND in, but it's the same approach with RAND. RAND in, same approach, but this means give me values that are between not less than two and not more than 10. Give me value between two and 10. So that's why it's giving me these uh, numbers, okay? Uh, you can see they are not less than two, they are not more than 10. You can play around that. And the last thing I would do here is how to convert your NumPy array to a data frame. This is a list of lists. Convert it to a NumPy array. Set the column names using whatever variable. I'm using names here, okay? But it has to match the number of elements you have in the array. I have five, that's why I have five names here. And then you can use pd.dataframe. My data is this new array. My column names is these names. And if you run that, it's going to give you that. So, and if you check the type, you can see it's a data frame. This is just a for loop, which we talked about last class. The last thing I would talk about here, I'll be very fast here so that, and then, yeah, so that I think we are actually, uh, um, we spend so much time. Okay, so it's matplotlib because as a data analyst or as a data scientist, if you want to make presentation, giving them group cal calculations and all of this, Many people are not math savvy. Many of your people, uh, your managers or whoever you are working with, they may not understand those, uh, those uh, columns, those uh, calculations. Quickly show them visualization. They will see. You can even you yourself, you quickly draw insight from a data. So Matplotlib and Seaborn are the standard library in, in, in Python to visualize your data, okay? So, and you import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. If it's not already there, use pip, pip install matplotlib. But I'm sure it's, it comes preloaded pre in your anaconda. So I can also import Seaborn as SNS. All these PLT SNS, they are not compulsory, but that is the standard solve people use. We don't, we don't want to keep on writing the full name. That's why we are saying import it as PLT import Seaborn as SNA instead of keep writing Seaborn all the time. Now, Seaborn has some data 
uh, uh, data that came that actually comes with it. So you can play with it. How do you load the data? Use load data set and ask come ask come yeah mean the is just one of the data that comes with it. I think down I I put a link for you to visualize for you to see all the data that comes with um Seaborn. So suppose I want to load this particular data that is already in Seaborn. You can also run it. It's going to work for you. This 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 is just the first five rows of that data. I can also check, I, I mean, I can check the tail to see. This is the last five rows. So it, it looks as if I have the data set. Data set is a categorical variable there for one, two, three, four. These are X and Y. So suppose you want to visualize it. Remember, we import it as PLT. If you call plot function on the PLT and you want to uh, plot the X variable in your data, and the y variable in your data, the default method, the default uh, display is going to be a line plot. If I plot this and show you, it's going to be a line plot. But suppose I want a scatter plot. All I just need to do is to pass in O in that square bracket, and it's going to give me a scatter plot. Yeah, if you use the plot method, you want a, a circle, just put O there, and it's going to give you a scatter plot. Uh, yeah, so that's what I did in this second line. But we can also plot scatter plot directly by using plt dot scatter, and then put all of these that I have here. I don't need to put the O again because I'm using scatter uh, method. So if I do that and do plt dot show, show means show my plot. So you can see, it still gives me the same thing as when you use your O, okay? Um, so uh, here, suppose you want to plot the X and Y for just data set one. You need to subset your data for, so, so, suppose I want to save it as data set one, subset it, I've, I've already talked about this uh, um, up there. earlier on, just select your data. On um, data set where is equals to this. I mean, we can check it or quickly see if you have. So you have. So this just quickly subset your data where you have data set to be one. So suppose I want to plot the scatter plot. Just your plt dot scatter, and then let's um, plot the x and y there. However, this we have already saved it as data one. So, so show it. See, this is just for the only where a data set is one. You can do it for others. Data subset for maybe for the second one, and then you can show it here. But here, we have not even labeling our data. So suppose you want to label the, the, your data, your X, because when you use PLT dot scatter, the first variable goes to your, your row, the second is your column. So label it. So just use PLT dot, your X label, and then put maybe your variable name. You can also do that for Y, Y label, and just put this. You can even put your type two, PLT dot type two. Okay, and then put your whatever title you have, maybe scatter plot of X and Y. And then show it. See, scatter plot of X and Y, your X, your Y. So that's how to label your scatter plot. Just label your data or your visualization. This one is a bar graph. What do you use bar graph? You use scatter plot, sorry, to visualize two quantitative variables. Two numeric variables. You cannot use color plots to visualize a categorical variable. But for bar graph, you can use that to count for a categorical variable. My categorical variable here is data set. And then I want to count the number of x. X is a variable there that I have in this categorical variable. And that's what I'm doing here. You can see that means for the fourth data set, I actually have many 
more observations in my, as my X in the fourth data, uh, category of the data set, like that. So I don't know how to do that. Uh, I don't know. I don't I actually want to cover all of this because you need you need that for because from next I want to move to machine learning. So you are gonna bear with me uh, for a few minutes to quickly go through this. There is another method, another way of doing your visualization. Instead of using the plt dot bar, you can first create a figure. The first thing here, what I did here was this one, the first one is not visualizing. So I just selected my data, I subsetted it, like I subset the data like where I have the data set equals to one, data set equals to two, three, and four. So the, if you're using this method, you have to first create the figure. I saved it as a variable name called fig, plt.figure. I can even set the fig size because if you press shift tab, you will see a variable name called fig size. But by default, it's none. If I need it, I can pass it into it. I can pass the fig size into it equals to this. Maybe I want the width to be 10. I want the uh, length height to be five. I can do that. Now, so you take your figure. This one, we only create the figure. If you run it, let's, let, let me even comment this out and just run it like that. If you run it, see, you just create the figure, but it's not gonna show anything. So to do, to put, start plotting things on your figure, call the fig and use add subplot. How do you know what should be inside? Come there and put shift up. See, there are no arguments that are, that compose, you see, add subplot. You need to have the number of rows as the first argument, number of columns, and the index, the position you want to put the plot. So this two here means I want two rows. This other two means I want two columns. This one means put the first, this first axis should be on the first plot. That's the index, that's this one. If I run that, see, I just have one. If I do that for the second one, look at the second one. Number of rows, number of columns, but I said put it in the second position. If I run it, see, I have two. So you can do that for the three, for four, three and four. You can play around that. Suppose I want to plot on the axis now, okay? Suppose I want to plot there. I want to plot on the first axis, though. So that's what I'm calling axis one here. Then I call on the plot method. What do I want to plot? The X in my data one and my Y in my data one. Then I want circle. So if I do that, see, it's going to plot on the first axis. By default, it's blue. If I want to plot on the second one, See, I call on axis two, which I already created here. I call on axis two, call plot, but I want to plot the second data on it. Now, if I put, if I remove this R, it's also going to plot by blue, but I want to change the color. That's why I'm putting R, meaning red circle. Red circle, see. I could even put plus. I mean, you can always play, I could even put plus. So whatever you want. So, um, so that's that. So suppose I want to set the, the, I want to set the title. Okay, so the same thing, call on the axis. If you are using axis, you are using set title. When I use PLT here, I just use PLT.title. So these are two different methods. But if you are using figure and creating axis, you have to use set title. If you use just normal title, it's going to give you error. Set title, if you do that, it's going to set title for the, for the first one because I call it on axis one. I can do that for the second one too. It's going to give me for axis two. See, this, that. I can do it for the three, for the four of them. Okay, I can do that. So, and then it's going to plot. This one is just to give, to add a title for the whole figure itself. The old figure I use, I call on the figure, the fig which I created there, and I use subtitle and pass in the name, the title I want. See, this is the title I want. This title layout is used anytime. If I plot all the four now, you will see that some of these title we overlap the x axis. So to make it not overlap, just use 
config the types layout. It's going to place your label, your data, uh, your visualization correctly and remove any overlap. This is the alternative method which I'm, you know, I'm trying to show if I want to use, if I don't want to do this, I, I want to use the, I want to use alternative method, like create the figure and the axis together. But here I'm not using add subplot, I'm using subplots, but I call it on PLT. How do I know that? Just click shift tab to see what you have there. See, by default, number of rows is one, and number of columns is one. So, but I want two rows, two columns. That's why I had to overwrite it by passing two comma two. It doesn't have index. So you cannot pass the third argument there. So you can always check this to know what you have. Plotting on the axis. See, I call on the axis. This zero means I want you to plot it on the first, the first axis, first row, first column. That's why it's zero comma zero. Then call on the plot, see? If I do that, you only call on the first one. If I want to include the second one, okay, I want to set the title on that, the same thing, just use set title, data set one. Suppose I want to do that for the second column, like first row, second column, that's zero means first row, this one means sec uh, second column, yeah. See, I have it on that. And you can play around that, the other ones too. This means one means second column, first row. Is plotting that. And you can also do that for this one. Means second column, second, second row, second column. And then you can show that. If I set the title for all of them, you can also do that using this set title and just put that there. If they if the labels overlap at the bottom, use this fig dot tight layout, and then you will see them neatly uh, plotted. This is for histogram. I actually loaded another data called tips. Yeah, yeah, tips. And then I visualize, I, I actually plot the histogram here, calling on the plt.east. You can always use that tab and check what you have there. Set the X label, the Y label, the title, and all of that. I can change the number of beans. Beans means the uh, the grouping. I can because if you press shift tab, you see that no argument, for, no, no, no value is passed for beans. Suppose I want just five beans, I can just do this and plot that, and then you have for five beans. So you are the one that you can set this to be whatever you want. This is the alternative method using the set set argument which I showed there. So I'm not, I mean, it's there for you to to play around with. Um, I'm not going to go to CBON because of our time. I think maybe the first 10 minutes next class before going to machine learning, I will do CBON. But there's a lot for you to take in there. Uh, this box plot, maybe I should stop here and um, we can continue from box plot next class. So I'm going to stop here and split you to breakout rooms so that you can do this uh, exercise here. This is the main exercise, but if you, let's say you are very fast and you want to go with the extra one, you can do that too. This data is already in your canvas for you to download and um, you know, upload to your notebook. This one is a direct link, so you can just put in the link direct, okay? So I'm going to stop sharing now and split you into breakout rooms. And then from there, we can take questions um, as you practice. Okay? Thank you. Uh, let me stop recording.